friends, welcome again to Panorama of Prophecy. We want to welcome those who are joining us here in our auditorium for this Bible study series where we're looking at some of the most important prophecies of the Bible. Now, I need to ask, is anyone attended all of the meetings here in person? Just raise your hand. Do we have some folks who have come to all the meetings? I see some hands. Well, thank you for, for your support. We are glad you are here again tonight. I want to greet our friends who are watching online across the country and around the world, also on the various television channels. Thank you for tuning in. A very exciting and important subject that we're going to be looking at today. Our topic is entitled, The Devil's Dungeon. And we're talking about a prophecy found in Revelation chapter 20, sometimes referred to as the Millennium. We have some material that goes along with that, our lesson. I think you're familiar with this. You can download the lesson at the Panora Panorama of Prophecy website if you're outside of North America. For those of you here, you can get it on your way out at the registration table. Make sure you're up to date. You can actually fill in the answers as we go through the various Bible verses. Our free offer for this evening is one of the Amazing Facts study guides. It's entitled, A Thousand Years of Peace. And this is free to anybody who asks. All you have to do is text the word thousand to the number 40544. You'll receive a digital download of our study guide. If you can't text, again, just go to the Panorama of Prophecy website and you'll be able to read it for free right there online. I believe you can even download it to your computer. So panoramaofprophecy.com. Again, we are so glad that you're here, and we're going to be singing our theme song. We were actually practicing it just a few moments ago before we went on the air, so we all know the words right here. For those who are joining us online, you can also sing along. I think we're going to have the words on the lower part of the screen. So let's stand as we sing together. John Lomacain, Kelly Maher will lead us in the music. Help me to know. Take me to hear that still small voice tenderly calling me. If wind and waves start mounting, speak the words, peace be still. Give me the mind of Jesus. Show me the truth that frees us. I want to do what pleases so help me to know your will. Lord, please help me to know your will. Let us pray. Dear Father, again, we thank you that we're able to gather together and open up your word and study a very important prophecy found in the book of Revelation. Lord, we pray that the Spirit would come and guide our hearts and our minds and be with Pastor Doug as he opens up the scriptures today. And I'll be with those who are here in person and also those who are watching online. Thank you, Father, to be able to study together. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. We want to thank those who have sent in their Bible questions at the Panorama of Prophecy website, also on Facebook and YouTube. I want to remind you, we are broadcasting this live in Spanish. So right now, if you want to view this in Spanish, go to the Amazing Facts Latino YouTube or Facebook page and you can watch it in Spanish. You can type in your Spanish Bible question if you like, and we will have folks answer that. For those of you here, we thank you for your Bible questions that you've written down and turned in. So at this time, we're going to invite Pastor Doug and Karen, and they're going to be doing Bible questions tonight. Thank you, Pastor Ross. Good evening. Oh, this is my fault. Yes. Can you scoot over while you're here, too? And, and I don't know if you noticed, every time he gets closer and closer and I keep moving away because there's a screen, a shot with just his face and other time you see I'm my now. arm in there and I'm going, no, no, no. So anyway, if you wonder what we're doing up here. <laughs> nice to see you tonight. Good evening, everybody. This is on live television. That's okay. I've just Hi, everybody. Used to be embarrassed. <laughs> I don't think they we're mind. We're so glad that uh, you joined us for Panorama Prophecy. And uh, if you're tuning in for the first time, this is a an epic Bible study. We're going through 25 presentations talking about some of the main foundational themes of uh, Bible prophecy and the scriptures, the teachings of Jesus, and we're hoping that you're blessed in this. But as our custom is, every night we start out by doing our best to just take Bible questions that have come in from both those that are here and those that are watching online and around the world. And, and so let's start with our first begin. question. Did the thief on the cross go to be with Jesus the day he died? 
Okay, we knew that would come in because we studied the subject about the resurrection in two different presentations. It's in Revelation, of course. And you find this in Luke chapter 23. You can look at verse 39. It's only found one place in the Bible. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other one answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you're under the same condemnation? This is a man being crucified. He's hanging there by uh, these nails. And he said, Why are you ridiculing this man? He's done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now that's remarkable that he would say that because around the cross that day, Jesus was being called all kinds of names, but they weren't calling him Lord. Mm -hmm. But here this thief, perhaps on his right hand, he turns to Jesus and in his dying hours, he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom, which means he believed he was not only Lord, but a king with a kingdom. And of all the people that were on the hill that day, Jesus looked like he was the least able to save anybody. But this man's mind was quickened by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And he heard Jesus forgive his enemies. He saw the sign above his head saying, this is the king of the Jews. He heard Jesus say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he remembered Psalm 22. They pierced my hands and feet. They gambled for my clothing. And the thief saw them gambling for his clothing. And the Holy Spirit revealed, this is the Messiah. Mm -hmm. His last hope was within a few feet. And he said, Lord, remember me. And Jesus, without hesitation, the reason he came is to save sinners. Here, the greatest joy that came to Christ on the cross was that someone was asking for salvation. Amen. He forgot his own suffering. And even though his hands were nailed to the cross, the devil could not keep the Savior from saving. And he said to that man, verily I say unto you today, you will be with me in paradise. Now, I worded it that way deliberately because there was no punctuation in the original Greek. The English translators had to decide where do we put the comma. If you put the comma in the wrong place, it changes everything. Yes. Jesus did not say to him, verily I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. How do you know that? Well, you go to John chapter 20 when Mary comes to the tomb and Jesus has risen. She grabs him by the feet to worship him. He said, do not cling to me. I have not yet ascended to my Father. So Jesus had not gone to paradise Friday afternoon. So how could he be with the thief in paradise that day if by Sunday morning he still hadn't been there? Mm -hmm. You know, I remember hearing a story one time years ago when they used to have Western Union telegrams. This man's wife went on a cruise and she went over to Europe and she telegraphed to him. She said, I found a beautiful white fox coat. I'd like to buy it costs, you know, $2,000. And he sent back a telegram, no price too high. So she comes home, gets off the ship. She's sporting this beautiful fox coat. He said, what are you doing with the coat? She said, you told me no price too high. He said, no. I said, no, price too high. <laughs> like, there's no comma. <laughs> Makes it the opposite meaning, right? Yes. And so, uh, Jesus said, verily I see unto you today, though I do not look like a savior, mm -hmm. though you look like you're condemned, you will be with me in paradise. I'm telling you today in front of all these witnesses, the emphasis wasn't you'll be with me in paradise that day because the thief didn't even die until hours later. And remember the uh, day begins and ends sundown in the Bible. So Jesus was promising him that day, you will be with me in paradise. All right, please help me understand Isaiah 9, 6. How can Jesus also be our everlasting Father? I think most of you know this verse. It's often quoted during Christmas. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. It's a prophecy about Jesus. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, right? And uh, they're saying, well, how could he be our Father and yet we pray to our Father in heaven. Who made all things? All things that were made were made by Christ. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, he's our Father. Jesus calls himself our friend. He calls himself our brother. And he is technically also our Father in that uh, he is our creator, our provider. The Bible tells us God opens his hand and satisfies the desire of every living thing. So it's just one of the metaphors that's used for Jesus. Don't get hung up on the earthly family model 
uh, the Lord is just trying to help us to understand his love and care for us. Amen. Will Jesus be coming in the east or northeast? And will he be sitting on his throne as a king or on his white horse? Well, when you see in Revelation 19, it shows Jesus coming on a white horse. That's probably symbolic. Uh, I don't think Jesus is galloping down to the world on a equestrian steed. Um, he also is pictured having a sword coming out of his mouth in that same chapter. We don't think Jesus has a sword coming out of his mouth. It's a symbol for the word of God. Revelation has a lot of symbolic imagery. Um, you know, Jesus, it, it does picture him coming to harvest the earth. Um, typically, a king, when he's on his throne, is not on a mission. So I don't see him coming in a sitting posture. Not that, you know, this really matters a lot. I think he's coming, standing up, coming to rescue. And uh, coming from the east, we believe so. Um, often there's, there's prophecies that seem to, do you know most cemeteries are arranged so that the tomb faces east? How many of you knew that? Not all, but many cemeteries are arranged on the little one in Kovalo. Mm -hmm. All the graves are facing east because they believe that the Savior is gonna come from the east. Why does the Bible not record much of Jesus's life in his early years as a youth? Well, he, he didn't begin any public ministry. He performed no miracles until he was baptized at 30 years of age. You do read in the Gospel of Luke that, you know, after this episode when he went to the temple when he was 12 years old and he kind of confounded the religious leaders with his brilliance and his wisdom, and it says, and then he went home with his parents and he was subject unto them and he waxed strong in wisdom and stature. He grew in wisdom and stature, meaning like other children, he got older, he got taller, he got smarter. He worked at home. Everyone knew him in Nazareth when he stood up to preach. They said, is this not the carpenter's son? Where did he get all these mighty miracles? And so he was just a citizen in the town, a godly individual. He, some people think, well, the Bible doesn't say much about him from 12 to 30. He probably went off to India and studied under the gurus there. He went to Egypt and he, he learned from these mystics in Europe. And I've heard all kinds of crazy theories. The Bible says he went home. He worked in the carpenter shop. And it begins really the gospels with his ministry. You realize the gospels can't tell us everything about Jesus. John in his gospel at the end said, if I were to tell you everything he did, the world itself could not contain the books. So he said, but these things are written that you might believe. And so God wrote what we needed for salvation. He says he waxed in favor, in favor with God and man as well yes. as the rest of that, scri That's that right. scripture. So he had a great relationship with family. In the community. Family and God. Family. Yep. All right. I recently gave my heart to Jesus and wanted to share Jesus' love to those around me. How do I share his love without sounding like I am trying to push my faith on them? Well, there's two things. With, with your, you know, if you meet an acquaintance, you can always start with... There's a formula called FORT, F-O-R-T. You begin asking about their family. O is occupation. R is religion. And T, personal testimony. You know, people can't really argue with your personal experience and testimony. Just tell them how good God has been. Sometimes you weave the Lord into the conversation and uh, just say, you know, God is so good or something nice happens. You say, praise the Lord. I've seen people open up and start talking. Uh, you might, how many of you have seen people like pray over their food in a public place? Mm -hmm. And you think, oh, that's a Christian. And I've struck up conversations like that. You don't want to be pushy, but you know, sometimes you might need to just take a risk. Um, every fisherman is because they're determined to catch fish. Sometimes they have to bring in an empty line. And so don't get discouraged if you approach religious subjects with a friend or family and they say, no, I'm not interested. Look for an opening. Three things you can do to reach the people you love. Three things. One thing, if they're open, share information. Right. Personal Bible study, give them a DVD, give them a website like Panorama of Prophecy to look at. Um, pray for them mm -hmm. and be a good witness. Be a good example. Those are the three things that you can do. Right. Always be willing to share your testimony. Yeah. Because they can't ever refute what the Lord has done for you in your life. So sharing what he's done, and you can even just tell him, you know, I've, I, I've met the Lord and I want to share, is that okay? Can and I share with you what mm -hmm. the Lord is doing in my life? Yeah, and if you're positive and happy, everyone wants to be happy. They're gonna to wanna to know, why are you happy? 
Oh, let me tell you about Jesus. Gospel's good news, right? Amen. Christians should smile more, be happy people. All right. Please explain Luke 16, 19 to 31, okay. the rich man and Lazarus parable. Yep. All right. This is, uh, a lot of people look at this passage and they get a little bit confused. It tells us in verse 19, chapter 16 of Luke, there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared or feasted sumptuously every day. And there was a certain poor beggar named Lazarus full of sores who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that, uh, and so it was that the beggar died and he was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and he saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he might dip the tip of his tongue in water for I'm tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that you in your lifetime receive good things, likewise Lazarus evil things. Now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between you and us, there's a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there come to us. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I've got five brothers, that they might testify to them, lest they come to this place of torment. And Abraham said, they've got Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. He said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone went to them from the dead, they would repent. But he said, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one should rise from the dead. This is a parable. You can go to chapter 16, verse 1. It says, he spoke a parable. There was a certain rich man that had a steward. Another parable about another rich man. Parables are not to be taken literally. How many of you believe that everybody saved goes to Abraham's bosom? How big is Abraham's bosom? It's obviously a, a figure. And it says, send Lazarus that he might dip his finger in water and cool my tongue from tormented in this flame. How cool would your tongue be from a drop of water? Uh, are the people in heaven and hell going to be able to talk to each other? Uh, let's hope not. Right. Uh, so you see, see what I'm saying? There's a lot of things here we know are not uh, literal. Why was Jesus telling this parable? First of all, notice what he does. Jesus is saying that the rich man, who is a symbol for the Jewish nation, feasting on the word of God, the poor man, the Gentiles, like Lazarus, laid at the gate desiring the crumbs that fell from the table. Jesus told another Gentile woman, it's not good to take the children's food and give it to the dogs, speaking of Israel and the Gentiles. Jesus said, I'm sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So he made it really clear what he's talking about. Look at the... the a, incredible juxtaposition that Jesus does between the two. He's got the Gentile, Lazarus, going to Abraham's bosom, the Jewish place of reward. And then he's got the rich man, the Jewish nation, going to the Gentile place of reward. The Gentiles believed in Hades, that's the word that's used here, ruled by Pluto, and it's, it's comical. Uh, and he's basically saying, many will come from the east and the west and sit down in the kingdom with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then, what's the name of the poor beggar? Lazarus. Lazarus. And Jesus says in the end of the parable, he says, if they don't believe Moses and the prophets, the word of God, they will not be persuaded that one should rise from the dead. Did Jesus raise someone from the dead by the name of Lazarus? Yes. Did his enemies start believing, or did they want to also kill Lazarus? And Amen. see, the whole purpose of the story was really, it was a warning to Jews and to Christians that if we sit in our churches and we feast on the word while the lost are begging the crumbs that fall from our table, we might find that those who love the word of God will be in the kingdom and we who take it for granted will not. Mm, yeah. It's a terrible warning. It has nothing to do with the state of man and death. It is a parable. Amen. Wow, thank you. Okay, what does the Bible say about tattoos? Uh, Leviticus 19.28, you shall not make any cuttings in your flesh or put any tattoos on your body. Don't get mad at me. Take that up with the Lord. You ask. I didn't put the question in. All right. Now, is it the unpardonable sin? No. And I, I know some friends that, I know one guy that had tattoos all over his face, came to the Lord and he said, boy, I wish I hadn't done that. And he actually tattooed his whole head with three, the three stooges. <laughs> some of you know who I'm talking about. He did his testimony on TV. Had it removed as well as you can with laser. It's very painful and expensive. I think someone volunteered. 
and that kind of leaves a little scarring too, so I don't recommend it. You know, most tattoos, people get real excited about it, and they're in love with someone, I'm going to tattoo your name, and then they break up and you got their name on, you got to change the name to the next person. And any tattoo looks like an antique map after a few years. You know that when you get old? So think twice, friends. I did a lot of dumb things in my life, but I never got a tattoo. Okay. <laughs> what language will we speak in heaven? Hindi. No, I don't know. <laughs> the, the language of Canaan, we don't know what they spoke at the Tower of Babel before the languages were confounded. If you ask the Spanish, they will tell you it is Spanish. That's right. And if you ask the Russians, they'll tell you it's Russian. So uh, we don't know. It'll be fun. It'll be a lot more. They say there are more words in the English language than any other language because it's a borrowed words from so many other dialects. So I think the language of heaven is going to be very versatile. Amen. All right, for our last question. Will the people in Sodom and Gomorrah be raised, the second, uh, be raised in the second resurrection to be burned up again? Yes, yeah, sorry. Evidently, they will. I mean, it's not just them, but there's a lot of people that die in a variety of ways that are maybe not pleasant. Uh, in the resurrection, you are judged, and then all the lost, it doesn't matter how you died in this life, all the lost are then cast into the lake of fire. Didn't we read that earlier today? We did. So, yeah. And uh, it's, it's a, a very um, uh, terrifying thought, but it tells you about the awful consequences of sin. But we learn the good news. Does hell burn forever? No. You know, the Bible tells us in Ezekiel chapter 28, speaking of the devil, I will bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, and it will devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes on the earth in the sight of them that behold thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. If anyone deserves to burn forever, it would be the devil. And he'll burn longer than anybody, mm -hmm. but even he will ultimately be consumed and brought to nothing. Amen. So I think that truth is pretty clear. All right. Thank you so much. Well, we're so happy to have Pastor John Lomakang and Kelly Maurer sharing with us a beautiful song, Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Salvation purchased by God, born of His Spirit and washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission and perfect delights. I have visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending ring from above. whispers of love. This is my story. This is my song. I'm praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior. Submission, all is at rest. For I am my Savior, we are happy and blessed. I'm watching and waiting, looking above, filled with God. 
God's goodness And I'm lost in His love And this is my story Yes, this is my song I'm praising my Savior All the day long For this is my story And this is my song my Savior all the day long. This is my story, yes, this is my song. I'm praising my Savior all the day long. For this is my story, this is my song. My Savior all the day long, praising my Savior all the day long. Amen. Thank you, John and Kelly. It's so much fun to watch Kelly play. She, she, she's smiling. She enjoys it. Welcome again, friends, to the Panorama of Prophecy Bible Studies. We're so glad to see each of you here at our, our local uh, church. I want to welcome those who we know are watching on a, a variety of stations. We sure appreciate that this is being carried by networks like 3ABN, Hope Channel, uh, Secrets Unsealed, Better Life, and if I've forgotten any, we're really thankful that you're carrying the program as well. I want to remind you that each of the studies tonight, every single presentation, well, we got a special one at the end. There'll be 24 presentations that are accompanied with a lesson. And so when you hear me teaching on the various points, these are the panorama of prophecy lessons. There's about 25 or 35 percent more in the lesson than you're going to get in the uh, lecture, and there's also more in the lecture than you'll get in the lesson. So using the two together, you'll have a lot of great information on these subjects that we're covering. Tonight's subject is one of my favorites, and it's based on a passage you find in Revelation chapter 20. We're calling it the Devil's Dungeon. And uh, I've got a lot to say, so you may hear me talking fast. I pray God will give you the spirit to listen fast. The Bible says, he that has ears, let him hear. And I just pray that uh, this is a very important subject that deals with the return of the Lord, the first and second resurrection, the great judgment, the earth made new. I hope it's all clear in your mind because there's a lot of confusion on these things. It's based upon a story. We use a story sort of as a springboard that you find in 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verse 11 to 21. Little background. When God first made the world, it was a beautiful paradise. And there was a perfect symbiotic relationship between the plants and the animals. And the vegetation always stayed uh, vital. And it's amazing, no matter where you go in the world, Antarctica, Siberia, they find fossil evidence that there used to be tropical jungles all around the world. It was beautiful. But with the entrance of sin, all of creation was corrupted. Animals began to eat each other or before they were friends, and the Bible tells us that the vegetation produced thorns and thistles. And there was an additional curse. You can read in Genesis chapter 3, God told Adam and Eve, he said, in the sweat of your face you will eat bread. And again, in Genesis 4, Cain was told as part of the curse, when you till the ground it will no longer yield its strength to you. I think it was George Washington Carver, who was famous because he really helped an economic resurrection in the South following the Civil War. The sharecroppers, they kept farming cotton, 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 and it sapped the ground from its nutrients. And Carver said, you've got to let the land lay fallow. You've got to let it recover and, uh, so that it can generate more nitrogen. And he had them introduce crops like sweet potatoes and peanuts. And that really was an economic salvation for them when they finally realized you've got to rest the land you can't keep farming the same thing all the time. 
The Lord told the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt, Moses said, Exodus 23, six years you will sow your land and gather its produce, but the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow, that the poor of your people may eat. They were to rest the land. They used to have a farming Sabbath every seventh year. Don't farm. Well, it's kind of hard sometimes to ask uh, farmers not to farm because it represents an economic loss. And evidently, the children of Israel often ignored this law. And so you find that from the time of King David up until the time of the Babylonian captivity, they were farming the land uh, year after year after year. We're not letting it keep a Sabbath. And so when God finally brought judgment on them 490 years after David, you can read that it says in, um, in first Corinthians or second Corinthians chapter 36, they were finally conquered by Babylon. And it tells us that, um, let me get the right slide up. Then they burned the house of God and broke down the wall of Jerusalem and burned all of its palaces with fire. Notice this very carefully. And those who escaped from the sword, he carried off to Babylon until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. As long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. So if you've got 490 years, how many uh, annual Sabbaths would you have? How many uh, seven-year Sabbaths would you have in 490 years? 70. So for every year that they neglected to let the land rest, God said, you're going to spend a year in captivity, Jerusalem, and the people is, uh, Jerusalem is going to be uh, uninhabited. The land is going to rest. It's very interesting. You can read about this. Nehemiah 1.3, the wall of Jerusalem is broken down. The gates are burned with fire. So God sort of compelled the land to rest. You know, the Bible tells us that um, for about 6,000 years now, Jesus has been sowing the gospel seed. Revelation tells us that he's coming with a sickle to harvest the earth. Several parables, Jesus talks about farming and harvesting. And during that time, after we are caught up to meet the Lord, the Lord is going to keep, or the land is going to keep, or the earth, a 1,000-year Sabbath when it is desolate. Sometimes it's referred to as the millennium. You find this mentioned in Revelation 20, and we'll read that together in just a minute. But we want to go out on the street and just see what some people say about the millennium. So I think when we get to the millennium, we're in the end stages of, of, of time. Um, I wouldn't say that we're in the millennium, even though we're calling this a millennium, I don't know that we're definitely in the millennium stage of, of, as the Bible defined it. Um, but it's toward the end times. I believe the millennium in the Bible is a thousand year period um, in Revelation somewhere. Um, that has to do with the cleansing of the earth, something like that. What I think about when I hear about the millennium is all of the many times throughout my long life where people have thought that the millennium was coming and they were wrong. I think the millennium is a literal thousand year reign at the very end of the tribulation of the seven year tribulation. All right. You know, it's interesting. Uh, a lot of people, you, they've heard about the millennium. The word is not found in the Bible. The word is based upon a chapter in the Bible that talks about a thousand year period. And the word millennium is a composite of two words, milli, thousand, annum, years. The teaching is in the Bible. I'm going to read this to you. And if you've got your Bibles, you can turn to Revelation 20. And I'll read some of it in sections here. But I want to start with Revelation 20. And we'll begin with the first verse. Then I saw an angel coming down to heaven. And then chapter 19 talks about Christ coming on the white horse, remember? Judgment that falls on Babylon. And then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that serpent of old. Now, who's that? Tells you right here. Who is the devil and Satan? Tells you what the symbol means. And bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him. <laughs> the devil once put Jesus in a tomb and put a seal on it to keep him in. Satan's going to be sealed in his own pit. That he should deceive the nations no more. That sounds good until you read the next part. 
till the thousand years are finished. After these things, he must be released for a little while. Oh, I kind of wish that wouldn't happen. Why is the Lord doing that? And then during the millennium, listen to what's going on. Verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and not received his mark on their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years are finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. And they will be priests of God and of Christ and reign with him a thousand years. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and he'll go out to deceive the nations that are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. The number is like the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints, the beloved city. And fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them. And the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and will be tormented day and night forever and ever. We talked about that a little earlier. Let's go to the lesson now and find out what we just read. And there'll be more in the Bible here we're going to bring out further on in the chapter. First question. These question and answers are just really good to make sure we cover the, all of the material in an organized way. What events mark the beginning of this 1,000-year period, what we call the millennium? It begins with the coming of the Lord. It tells us, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, and the dead in Christ will rise first. We just read, Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. So it's talking about the saved are the ones who are raised first. Furthermore, you read in Revelation 20, verse 4, They live and reign with Christ for a thousand years. You can also read Revelation 20, verse 5. The rest of the dead, now let me ask you a question. If the dead in Christ rise first, the dead in Christ means the dead who are saved, who are the rest of the dead? The dead who are not saved, the lost, the wicked. You know, there's only two resurrections. You get, there's no Switzerland or neutral resurrection. Christ said, if you're not with me, you're against me. Isn't that what he said? And so you want to be in that first resurrection, right? You come up out of your grave and Hitler's next to you. That's not good. I think he's in the second resurrection. It says, this is the first resurrection. So again, we, we mentioned that you don't find the word millennium in the Bible, but the teaching is there. You don't find the word trinity in the Bible, but the idea of the triune entities or the three entities of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is in the Bible. And... Uh, so milli annum is just, it means a thousand years. And so when we say millennium, we're talking about this thousand year period. Uh, it begins with the first resurrection at the end of the 1,000 years. It says the rest of the dead live after the thousand years is finished. You get the second resurrection. Now, I was always surprised to learn there's two resurrections. When I first started studying the Bible, I thought it all happened at the same time. The Lord spreads them out. Read in Daniel chapter 12. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to everlasting shame and contempt. Got two resurrections. Jesus said, The hour is coming in which all that are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. John chapter 5. They that have done good, resurrection of life. They that have done evil, resurrection of damnation or condemnation. Number two, what else happens at the first resurrection? We shall not all sleep but we will all be changed. And you read on here in 1 Corinthians 15, 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead shall be raised. Now those who are dead, they're raised, they're given glorified bodies. Those of us who are alive, we get new bodies. You read in Philippians 3, 21, who will transform our lowly body that it might be conformed to his glorious body. This verse wasn't near as important to me when I was like 19 years old as it is now. <laughs> the older you get, the better this verse looks. Amen? Get that new glorified body without any aches and pains. I am looking forward to that. And it's an upgrade over anything. You'll be Superman compared to anybody in the world today when you get your glorified body. It's a real body. The idea that we're ghosts floating around, the Bible doesn't say that. 
Jesus rose from the dead with a glorified body. He ate in front of the disciples. It'll be like when God made Adam and Eve. Did Adam and Eve do real things and have real physical bodies? Yeah. We will too. But Adam and Eve before sin, they could see God. They could see angels. We've lost our whole spiritual dimension. And we will have bodies that are prepared to live eternally, always a vital one. You'll run and not be weary. You'll mount up with wings like eagles, uh, powers. You'll be able to see better, hear better, everything better. And then this lawless one, what happens to the wicked? Then that lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will destroy with the brightness of his coming. And so you've got the righteous who are alive. They're transformed. The righteous dead are resurrected. The wicked who are dead stay dead. The wicked who are alive are destroyed. And we are caught up to meet the Lord in the air. The Bible tells us that when the Lord comes, there is a great earthquake. This, this world becomes uninhabitable at that time. There is a great earthquake, Revelation 16, 18. Such a mighty earthquake as has not occurred since men were on the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. Goes on to say, every island fled away and the mountains were not found. You're not going to be able to go online and find out what kind of earthquake it was. Or you check the news and say, what was it on the Richter scale? This is a global catastrophe earthquake. And then it says a great hail fell from heaven upon men. Each hailstone about the weight of a talent. That's about 75 pounds. I remember in Texas that we had hail. I looked out the window and it was walnut size hail. It really was. And it, we just thought the roof was going to come in. <laughs> and we went out. I mentioned my little Mazda GLC earlier. A little car went out. It looked like someone had taken a ball-peen hammer all over the car. And the body shops all over town, they had all these cars that were total because it, you, they can't do enough body work. Your car would be pure bondo after something like that. Can't repair them. I'll tell you an amazing fact. I like to sprinkle amazing facts in the presentations. By the way, if you didn't know, this is how Amazing Facts got its name. We started with a radio program 56 years ago. And we begin with an amazing fact and then bring in spiritual truth. Then it grew into television and lessons and, and uh, mission work and everything else we do. There were some rangers that worked for the British government in 1946 that were exploring a valley 16,000 feet up in the Himalayas. And they ran into a valley filled with bones, human bones. Some of them, because it's so cold up there, it looked like they'd been preserved, and some of them still had clothes and hair, and, and it was a mystery. They wondered, was there a, a battle up there at this elevation? What had happened? And it stayed a mystery for years until a special expedition went up, and they did some research. A lot of them had been wounded around the shoulders and the head. They finally realized these 300 pilgrims over a 1,000 years ago were crossing the mountains. They get caught in a tremendous hailstorm. And there was nowhere to hide. And they huddled together until they were just beat to death by this hailstorm. Very large hail that sometimes happens in those mountains up there. Ezekiel talks about a valley of bones. You ever read about that? That's another subject. Big hail, it does happen. And an angel laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. So we see that Satan is captured, he's bound. Now where is he bound? It tells us that the devil is cast into this, what is it? Bottomless pit. That word there, bottomless pit, has confused a lot of people. And folks wonder, is it a black hole out in the universe somewhere? Is it a wormhole? And what is this bottomless pit? How do you picture that? I remember reading a story, another amazing fact. A teenage boy, he's about 16 years old. His name was James White in New Mexico, out uh, rounding up some missing cows one day. And he saw a fire on the horizon and he rode towards the, the smoke and it turns out it was not smoke but there was a tornado of bats that were boiling out of the ground and he thought well that's really something must be quite a cave they can haul, hold all those bats came back a few days later very brave young man he made a fence out of some barbed wire and some sticks lowered himself in with a kerosene lamp and began to explore what was later called Carl's Bad Caverns once he was off in there by himself he, before he told anyone else about it and the lamp went out. And he had to, no way in the world, there's chasms everywhere that you could get out without 
killing yourself, and he had to pray that he had extra matches to light the lamp, which he did. He ended up becoming the guardian of Carlsbad the rest of his life. But in Carlsbad Caverns, I've been there. I don't know if any of you have been there. They had a place that was called the Bottomless Pit. And there was this precipice and a deep old yawing chasm that went down into the darkness, and you could shine your light down there. You couldn't see the bottom. And the tour guides would sometimes go by. James White would, he'd take a little rock, he'd throw it over the edge, and it would go. He'd say, a bottomless pit. That rock just came out of China. <laughs> well, a few years later, they sent an expedition down. It was about 300 yards deep. And at the bottom of the hole, there was all this very fine, powdery lime dust. And all the rocks would hit the dust and go poof, and they never heard that. But um, what is bottomless pit? Well, the word in Greek is abusos. And the word simply means abyss. It means a place where the devil has no one to inhabit. It is the same word that is used in the Greek Septuagint that is for when the earth is without form and void. It describes our world in a state of chaos. You can read in the Bible, in uh, Luke chapter 8, it talks about these devils, demoniac. This man is possessed with uh, a legion of devils. And the devils beg Jesus, when you cast us out, do not cast us out into the, it says deep, the very word is abusos, exact same word that you find in Revelation. We don't know what the King James translators were thinking, but when they got to the end and they th thought they'd get creative, they said, hmm, abyss. Let's call it a bottomless pit. But it just means a place where demons have nobody to possess. Again, it describes the world in a chaotic, undeveloped condition with no men. I'll prove that to you as we read on in just a minute. Who will be raised in the second resurrection, and when will that take place? All who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those that have done good, the resurrection of life, and those that have done evil, the resurrection of condemnation. I just quoted that one to you. And you read in Revelation 20, verse 5, the rest of the dead, if all the righteous have come forth in the first resurrection, the rest of the dead are the wicked. They do not live again until the thousand years are finished, which implies they do at least briefly live again for their judgment at the end of the 1,000 years. Number four, what is the condition of the earth during the 1,000 years? Now, this is where a lot of people are surprised. Look at this. You can read in Isaiah 24, Behold, the Lord makes the earth, what's that word up there? Empty. Folks at home didn't hear you. Say it again. The earth is going to be empty. Now, there's a couple of scenarios about the millennium. And it's really important that we understand the difference. Some people believe that the righteous are reigning over the wicked here on earth during the 1,000 years. They believe that just before the tribulation, the saved are raptured. But then during seven years of tribulation, 144,000 Jews in will be preaching, converting more people, so that when Jesus comes back, he's now coming and he's going to reign on earth where those who are faithful, reigning over the wicked. Some have immortal, eternal bodies. Some are still being born and dying, I guess. And then at the end of that, he judges the wicked and we stay on earth. That doesn't fit in with all these verses that say there's a time when the earth is a desolate and it is keeping a 1,000-year Sabbath. It's been vacated. Look at these other passages in the Bible. For instance, Jeremiah 4.23. I beheld the earth, and indeed it was without form and void, and the heavens, and they had no light. Now, if I stop right there, you'll think, he's describing before creation. I'll keep reading. He's not. It says, I beheld the mountains, and indeed they trembled. I beheld, and indeed there was no man, and all the birds of heaven had fled, and the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all its cities were broken down. There were people there, but they're not there anymore. They're, the birds have all fled. And that's referring to Revelation, the birds of carrion. Talks about the feast of the vultures in Revelation on the wicked. And the cities are broken down. What caused all this devastation? It says, the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. Look at this verse in Jeremiah 25, 33. And at that day, the slain of the Lord shall be from one end of the earth even to the other end of the earth. They are not lamented or gathered or buried. Why? There's no one alive to gather, lament, or bury them. See, what happens is when Jesus comes back, what direction do we go? We go up. What happens to the wicked? 
they're destroyed by the brightness of his coming. This earth is going to get a thousand year Sabbath. We are not living and reigning here on the earth over the wicked. I don't know about you. I have no desire to reign over the sinners. We are living and reigning with Christ as his ambassadors. He says, I've gone to prepare a place for you. We go up when he comes. The earth is a dark, chaotic mess. Satan is bound on this void, this abusos. And at that day, the oh, I read that already. Number five. Where will the saints be during the 1,000 years, and what are they doing? All right. Jesus said, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, he's on up in heaven with the Father in the mansions he's prepared, you may be also. He says, the dead in Christ rise. We're caught up. We meet him in the air. We go with him to that place. We've got glorified bodies now. What are we doing? I saw thrones. And they that sat upon them, and judgment was given to them. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. What kind of judging is going on here? Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Furthermore, you can read 1 Corinthians 6, verse 3. Do you not know that we will judge angels? Now, obviously, we're not judging good angels. They've not done anything wrong. There's no prosecution. But the Bible talks about these fallen angels that are in everlasting chains of darkness. You can read in 2 Peter and in the book of Jude. They're awaiting their great day. When Jesus was alive and teaching, it says the demons would call out to him and say, Jesus, Son of God, we know who you are. Have you come to torment us before the time? Satan's come down with great wrath because he knows his time is short. There's a day of judgment coming for these evil spirits. Now, you and I, how many of you have been tempted? Every hand should go up. If you feel no temptation, you're in big trouble. It means you're not resisting. <laughs> you and I are going to be testifying and say, I am a victim <laughs> of what these fallen spirits have done. And we'll be there. You're not only going to meet your guardian angel, you might meet the demon who's been harassing you all your life that studied your weaknesses. And you will bear witness against them. So what are we doing during the 1,000 years? Well, someone said there's going to be th three big surprises in heaven. I think I mentioned this. One surprise is that you're there. The other surprise is that you're going to see people there that you never dreamed would be there. And the third surprise is there are going to be people missing that you thought would be leading the parade in heaven. Now, suppose you get to heaven and you got your Uncle Elmer, and he just seemed like such a godly man, deacon in the church, smiling all the time, carried his Bible under his arm, and you thought that, wow, he's going to be in heaven. You're going to get to heaven and say, where's Uncle Elmer? And the angel's going to put his eyes down and say, well, you know, I got some sad news. He's not here. What? Come with me. The Bible says there's books. I don't know if God is going to have old-fashioned books or a video or how he's going to do it, but he'll show us everything's recorded and the angel's going to play, play back. You realize the Bible says everything done in secret will be proclaimed from the housetops. Unless your sins are under the blood, you're in trouble. I don't want you seeing my book and you don't want me seeing yours. Can you say amen? But if you're lost, your book is going to be open because your sins are not covered by the blood and you're going to look and see Uncle Elmer, oh, he looked real good in public, but there was some private sin. Well, Lord, but why didn't you save him? You'll see everywhere in his life where God tried to reach him, and he hardened his heart. And finally, you'll say, Lord, you did the right thing. You had no choice. See, during that 1,000 years, we're going to have a lot of questions. And you're going to say, why is that person here? I think I told you Stephen's going to get to heaven. Last thing he saw was Paul or Saul was participating in his execution, persecuting Christians. Then he gets to heaven in the resurrection, and he sees Paul is one of the most uh, honored characters. He's going, what? You guys made a mistake. The angel's going to say, Stephen, come with me. And he'll read about the conversion of Paul and how he became one of the most devoted followers and how Paul died a martyr's death for Christ. And then you'll see Stephen and Paul embrace each other in the kingdom. So we're going to have a thousand years worth of questions. The Lord wants us to enter eternity trusting his judgment. The Bible says in the book of Revelation, chapter 15, thy judgments have been made manifest. 
all the God's judgments will be open so that we can trust him as we enter eternity. I've got questions I want to ask some of the Bible characters. Don't you want to meet some? I want to meet David. He seems so interesting. I want to ask Jacob how he did not know that it was Leah until the morning. Am I the only one that's wondered about that? It says, and in the morning, behold, it was Leah. That's too much information, actually. <laughs> but we're going to be living and reigning with Christ, and we're going to be having our questions answered and talking to our angels and participating in the imminent decision and decree of the lost. Those of us that were under the condemnation of the world will end up being the judges, including Christ, who was being judged by Caiaphas, the high priest, and Pilate. And Jesus let them know. He said, someday the tables are going to turn. Instead of being the judged, I will be the judge. Another amazing fact. Can you say Baron Fabian von Schlabendorf? This man, he was an attorney back in the 1930s in Germany. When the war broke out, he was sort of pressed into the German army, and quickly he was promoted. But he could see that Adolf Hitler was crazy, and he was destroying Europe and the country. He became part of the resistance that tried to get rid of Hitler. Matter of fact, he planted a bomb on a plane that Hitler was on, and it malfunctioned. It didn't go off. Eventually, they caught up with him. He was arrested. And near the end of the war, they brought him in for trial, and he was in the courtroom. And everyone in the courtroom testified against him, they pronounced him guilty, and they were leading him out to be shot when the air raid sirens went off. The courthouse received a direct hit from an Allied bomb. Everybody was killed, except Fabian von Schlippendorf, who wasn't even injured. He briefly escaped. They apprehended him near the end of the war, but he was then part of the group that was liberated. Later, he became a judge in Germany. The, the accused became the judge. I love these amazing stories from history. The tables will turn, friends. What will happen at the close of the 1,000 years? Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, and in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. This is Zechariah 14, verses 1, 4, 5, 9. His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives will split in two. This is one of those apocalyptic prophecies in the Old Testament where Zechariah pictures the Savior coming down. It's at the end of the 1,000 years. Feet touch the Mount of Olives. Why the Mount of Olives? This was a place that was especially precious to Jesus. You know, he was born in Bethlehem that was just down the hill from the southern side of the Mount of Olives. On the Mount of Olives, he told his disciples about the fall of Jerusalem and the signs of his second coming. It was on the Mount of Olives that Jesus wept over Jerusalem when he came in and they had that triumphal entry. It was on the Mount of Olives, you've got the Garden of Gethsemane, where he was arrested, and he sweat and prayed, not my will, thy will be done. And it was from the Mount of Olives by Bethany when he ascended to heaven. He said, as I left, I'm coming back. That's what the angel said in Acts chapter 1. So Jesus is coming back. He'll be visible, he'll be real, and he's coming back the same place he left. And when his feet touch the Mount of Olives, something happens. And then the earth is already a mess. You know, when bulldozers come in and they try and rebuild after a terrible earthquake, they just clear a big area. Jesus' feet touch that mountain and it splits. There's seismic activity. It splits and it forms a tremendous valley and in that valley, the new Jerusalem comes down and settles in. As a matter of fact, I think this is in our um, next verses. Thus, the Lord my God will come and all the saints with you, and the Lord will be king over all the earth. So he comes to the new Jerusalem. All the saints are with him at that time. And it says, I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, the millennium is what chapter in Revelation? Revelation chapter 20. What chapter does it say the new Jerusalem comes down? It says that's going to be in chapter 21. And so at the end of the 1,000 years, the new Jerusalem comes down from heaven and it settles in this valley that God has prepared. We looked at the dimensions of that city when we studied heaven. It tells us it's 375 miles around. 
you realize that God gave Abraham a promise that he would inherit a physical promised land. The Bible says Abraham looked for a city that had foundations whose builder and maker is God. He didn't inherit it during his life. But the whole in, uh, circumference of the New Jerusalem is big enough to enclose all of the land that God promised the Jewish nation. The whole entirety of everything that God gave to Abraham and David and Solomon will fit in that space. It's about as big as the state of Oregon. So this is it's a massive, glorious event when this happens. What happens next to free Satan from his prison? The Bible says that when Jesus comes down, not only does the new Jerusalem uh, descend, but the rest of the dead don't live again until the thousand years are finished. There you've got it, Revelation 20, verse 5. Which means what? At the end of the 1,000 years, the devil's released from his prison. You know one reason the earth is called a prison for Satan, a bottomless pit during the 1,000 years? Satan is a workaholic. Would you agree? You ever heard someone say he works like the devil? I remember hearing a story where it uh, talked about this man. He worked in an office where um, there was a, a lady, and she was always a positive, upbeat Christian. This man was kind of a negative atheist. And whenever he'd say, oh, man, it's pouring cats and dogs out there, she was always positive. She said, yeah, the flowers are going to be beautiful in May. And he said, you know, the politicians, what they're doing is terrible. She said, I'm so thankful for the freedoms that we enjoy. And he used to get so irritated at her because everything he said where he's just complaining, she'd always turn it positive. One day he thought, I got her. She's a Christian. And one day he went into the office and says, boy, that devil, isn't he terrible? And she said, well, he certainly is busy. <laughs> he can't stand to be idle. Do you realize what, what is going on? Why is Satan being released from his prison? Why is he bound like this for a thousand years? Why, God doesn't, why doesn't Jesus just destroy him? You realize that for a thousand years, Satan and his angels are bound. The Lucifer, the devil, Lucifer, he told these other angels, if you follow me, I've got a better government. I can do better than God. Satan's had 6,000 years in this world to demonstrate what his government would be like. I know you're thinking it's not fair that it happened here to us, but our first parents chose to listen to Lucifer instead of God. God said, don't eat it. The devil said, eat it. And they listened to the devil. And whoever you obey, that's whose servants you are. Satan set up his rebellion here on this planet and look at what's happened to our world under his leadership. Now for a thousand years, Satan and his angels need to roam this dark, cold planet, and they look at the results of their rebellion. Broken down cities, the earth is all cracked. It was a paradise. And his government of self-first, selfishness, destroyed everything. So at the end of the 1,000 years, when the new Jerusalem comes down, Jesus' feet like a hypodermic needle he brings all the dead back to life. He calls them back to life. The devil can't resurrect anybody. Even Jesus is the only one who can resurrect the lost. He brings them forth. Now, all the people who have ever lived through the ages, we got almost 8 billion people alive on the world today. You add that up with all the people that have lived through history, you got billions of people that come out of the grave. Unfortunately, the majority are among the lost. Satan is going to see this vast army, and someone's going to ask a question. So when they come out of their graves, do they come out like they went in? And, you know, I think God's going to put them back together enough where they know what's going on. Uh, they don't get the glorified bodies. The Bible talks about a time when the lost will seek death and they cannot find it. They won't even be able to commit su suicide during that time. And the devil's going to see this vast army, and he's going to probably have... Napoleon, Alexander the Great, and all these other military leaders that are out there say, you know, there's more of us than there are of them. In one desperate final attempt, he tries to rally them all to attack the city, showing that he hasn't changed. What loses him from his prison? A prison for the devil is nobody to tempt and manipulate. Those devils, when they were cast out of that man, they said, Jesus, please don't cast us into the abusos, the nothingness. Let us possess the herd of pigs up there. The devil, he's happier to possess a serpent or pigs or people or animals or something, but don't give us nothing. And so now the devil and his angels, they see all these people, they listen to the devil during their earthly lives, they're ready to listen again. You realize that before Jesus comes, Satan is going to seek to impersonate Christ. 
And so they recognize him. And he's going to say, see that city? That's my city. The one inside that city, he took it unlawfully from me. We can take that city. There's more of us than there are of them. And he's going to try and rally the lost one final battle against the, the saved. The rest of the dead do live after the 1,000 years. Now, when the 1,000 years have expired, Satan is loosed. He's released from his prison. He gets busy immediately. Satan always wants an audience, and now he's got a big audience. And a little amazing fact from history, Napoleon Bonaparte. He had a little corporal that ended up ruling much of Europe for about 10 years. He finally lost the battle of all nations, and uh, they, ex they sent him to Elba, this island. And they were preparing to send him to St. Helena, off in the middle of the Atlantic, where he could never uh, cause a rebellion again. But he got involved in a daring escape. He escaped from El before they um, banished him to St. Helena, came back to France, and for 111 days, he came back into his power. His army was ready to follow him again, and he launched one final battle. The European leader said, we defeated you once. Here, you get back. The first thing you do is you rebel again. And ultimately, it ended. You've heard of the Battle of Waterloo? He looked like he was over, and he came back for one final battle. Makes me think about the devil. Looked like it was finished, but as soon as he's released, God is demonstrating he has no choice but to destroy the wicked, because as soon as they're brought back to life, they're fighting God again. The devil's had a thousand years to repent. Does he change? No. What will Satan do when the wicked are raised? He'll go out to deceive the nations that are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog. To gather them together to battle, the number is as the sand of the sea. Now, I've got to pause here real quick, and people say Gog and Magog. I've heard some strange theories about this. They say Gog and Magog. That's China and Russia. They're all going to come against Israel. And I remember going on a tour of Israel where a pastor stood there by the Valley of Megiddo, and he said, if you know about the Battle of Armageddon, that word is found once in Revelation chapter 16. He said, soon the armies of China... The armies of Russia will gather in this, this valley. And I'm looking, I'm going, there's no way you're going to fit those armies in this valley. Gog and Magog do not mean Moscow and China. You look in the Old Testament, Gog was, um, he was one of the ancient enemies. You find him in Genesis, I think, chapter 10, one of the ancient enemies of God's people. The names in Revelation are all symbolic talks about Balaam in Revelation. He's long dead and gone. Talks about Jezebel. It's a symbol. You go to the Old Testament and find out who did those people represent. Jezebel persecuted the prophets. Uh, Balaam was a thief. He was covetous. Gog was an enemy of the land of Israel. Magog simply means from the matrix or the children of Gog. So you've got Gog and the children of Gog. Talk about the evil. Gog and Magog just means the evil. You find it re also referenced in Ezekiel 37. Talks about Gog and Magog. To understand Revelation, go to the Old Testament. It says they cover the earth like a cloud. They come against the people of God. They try to destroy the city of Jerusalem. It's the final attack on God's people, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth. This is a global army. It's not just one nation. And they surround the camp of the saints, the beloved city, the new Jerusalem. Now, friends, this is where it gets really interesting. Everybody here this evening, do you know we are all going to meet again someday? I promise you. See, there's only four kinds of people. You've got the righteous alive and the righteous dead. You've got the wicked alive and the wicked dead. This is an event where everybody will be present and accounted for. You've got God and Christ and the good angels. You've got the devil and his fallen angels all present and accounted for at this event. This is the time of the great executive phase of the judgment. We've been involved in a part of the judgment where we're doing some investigation during the 1,000 years. This is the pre-advent judgment before Jesus comes. We studied. This is the final phase of judgment where sentence is meted out. Satan has now demonstrated after he's had 1,000 years to repent. I can just picture during that 1,000 years, all these demons that were, they used to be good angels. They chose to trust the devil. 
They're going to say, look at where we're at now. We listen to you and look at this. He's going to have to listen to the mocking and reprisals of all these demons that followed him because he said, I could be a better God than God. But now they're all desperate. And the first thing they do is try to launch an attack on God. God has to show the people in the city, you know, I hate to think about this, but you and I are probably going to know some people that are on the outside of the city. That's going to be heartbreaking. God forbid it's family or someone you love. For us to trust and love God through eternity, we're going to have to see he had no choice. They were ready to listen to the devil first chance they got. They haven't changed. He can't let them in. The angels, God's about to destroy some of their former friend angels. They used to be good angels. They all knew each other. They used to follow Lucifer. He was their leader. God's going to destroy this mightiest creation. He needs to demonstrate I have no choice. God is very patient, isn't he? Very patient, very merciful. And he gives us time to learn. But finally, we get to the point where there may not be any more redeemable qualities. Also, during this period of time, we don't know how long, the Bible says he's loose for a little season. We don't know how long this final phase is. It may be weeks, long enough for them to organize to attack the city of God. We're going to be thinking about people that maybe persecuted us and mistreated us, and they're all outside the city. We're going to be um, maybe seeing people that will say, why didn't you tell me about your faith? You know, it isn't until you get to Revelation 21, God wipes away all tears from their eyes. I know it's hard to imagine, but sometimes there's sadness in heaven. When Jesus was on the cross, you think the angels were smiling and singing? No. And this is going to be a time that is going to be very profound and there'll be some very sober situations there when everybody meets again. And I think there's going to be a lot of revelation. Uh, everything that uh, the lost have ever done against anybody is going to be plain. And you're going to see fights breaking out among the lost. I'm here because of you. Why didn't you tell me? Parents, they said to the kids, oh, you can go to church if you want to, but we're staying home. And the kids grow up and they go wild and, and they say, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you lead me to God? It's going to be a very sobering time. It says, you will come up against my people, Israel, like a cloud to cover the land, all the wicked who have ever lived. At this crucial moment, what stops everything? Before Satan launches his final attack, I don't know if he's going to have enough in intelligence or materials or resources to build weapons or put together nuclear bombs. I don't know, but he's going to try and launch this attack against the New Jerusalem. At this crucial moment, just before they launch their final attack, and Satan says, charge, let's attack the city. The only chance they've got is attacking the city and listening to Lucifer. They know they're doomed otherwise. You read in Revelation 20, verse 11 now, I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things that were written in their books. We are saved by grace through faith, but if we're not saved, we're judged by our works. Matter of fact, even the saved are judged by their works because their works show whether they're saved, even if that work is a work of believing. Now, Jesus once said, this is the work you shall do. Believe on the one the Father has sent. Now, can the Lord save 3,000 people at one time at Pentecost? Can he judge a thousand people at one time? I think sometimes we think of the judgment and God's going to say, okay, line up, take a number like when you go to Baskin Robbins or the parts store and everybody's waiting. Okay, next, the bailiff says, the angel there, and you come up and they open the books. God is going to play out in the heavens the whole thing. There, just before Satan launches attack, Christ is going to be exalted above the city where everybody in the world can see him. Enthroned, the right hand of the glory of the Father. And in the sky, a panorama of the great controversy between good and evil is going to play out. How God sent his own son and all the sufferings of Christ and all the opportunities in every person's life to be saved. I think you've heard when a person almost dies, their life flashes before them. It happens very quickly. This may not be so quick. God is going to take people all through the history. Their memories are going to be restored. They're going to see everything God did to try to save them, and they would not. And ultimately, 
they realize there's nothing else that God could do. Question 10, what will happen after the wicked are judged? As I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me and every tongue will confess to God. You can read on here in Philippians 2, verse 10 and 11, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven, those on the earth, those under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. See, Satan, he wanted to be God. He told Jesus, bow down, worship me, and I'll give you the world. Christ said, thou shalt not worship anyone but God. And Satan wanted Christ's position. Ultimately, everybody's going to be brought to the point where they bow down and they confess. Now, for the righteous, if you repent and confess Jesus' name before he comes, you can be saved. Those who confess the name of Jesus afterward are confessing like Judas confessed when he went into the temple and he threw down the blood money and he said, I betrayed innocent blood. That was too late. He was just overwhelmed with a sense of his guilt and the foreboding of his punishment. That is the wrong kind of repentance. It's like when the Pharaoh repented when all the plagues began to fall. That repentance won't save you. It's like the sign out in front of the Baptist church, repent now and avoid the rush, right? Now is the time when the door of mercy is open for us to repent. Can you say amen? amen? It says, I heard a loud voice, Revelation 19, 1 and 2, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, true and righteous are his judgments. Before we enter eternity, God wants us to see that he is just, that he is fair, that he is good, that he is love. And even in the punishment of the wicked, he is doing the loving, just thing. God has no alternative but to do that. So, everybody's going to meet again that day. What happens next? Fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them. Before they ever get the fire off, the first shot. There was a time once when Jerusalem was surrounded by the Syrian army. And they said, surrender. We outnumber you, 10 to 1. God told King Hezekiah, do not fear. They will not fire an arrow here. I will fight for you. And the angel of the Lord went through the camp, and in one night, 185,000 of their soldiers died. And they retreated back to their land where the king then was slain by his own sons. This is hearkening to that they don't even get to fire a shot. After they all kneel and they say, Jesus Christ is Lord. After this white throne judgment where everyone's life passes before them and they see that God did all he could to save them, but they kept procrastinating. They would not surrender. They would not trust Jesus. Then God rains fire down upon the wicked and it says it devours them. Now, different people are going to suffer different lengths of time. He that has sinned much will suffer for much. To whom much is given, much is required. There'll be some people that will probably die very quickly. They had very little light or knowledge in their lives. And uh, who do you think is going to suffer the longest? The devil. He has on his back the guilt of the whole world and all the fallen angels. He led and he instigated. You know, all of us have an influence for good or evil. I want my life to tell for good. I spent too many years in my youth having an evil influence. And, but everybody, the Bible says that uh, we'll answer for those things. If your sins are not forgiven and under the blood, there's a punishment for that. So everyone is going to be rewarded according to what they deserve. There will be some lost young people that maybe did not have knowledge. They'll die very quickly. Adolf Hitler, Idi Amin, and others, they're going to look at the millions that died. Joseph Stalin, millions that died because of their evil leadership. And anyone who is not written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. As that fire rains down, it continues to build up until it forms a lake. We saw that happen here in California about a week ago. Had a famine in the land, and then we had a downpour, and now there's lakes where there was dust. Have you noticed? And the wicked are then devoured. This is the second death. Now, let's just review what's going on here. Beginning of the 1,000 years, First resurrection, second coming of Jesus. The end of the 1,000 years, the wicked, second resurrection, Holy Spirit, a holy city descends. The new Jerusalem comes down to earth. During the millennium, the righteous are in heaven. 
We're engaged in judgment, having our questions answered, enjoying a 1,000 year Sabbath with the Lord. For 6,000 years, you had this, this battle between good and evil here in the world, right? We're going to get a millennial rest with the Lord during that time. The earth is desolate. It is keeping Sabbath during that time. After the fire goes out, what will God do for his people? Oh, friends, I want to see this. The Bible says, for I create a new heavens and a new earth. Eventually, the fire will burn. The last one to burn is the devil. How long that is, I don't know. Evidently, more than a day and a night, because it says day and night forever and ever. And we learn forever and ever means until you're all gone. Right? He's going to be consumed. I'm glad that he's going to be gone, that he's not going to be like Napoleon where he can escape and come back again. And then eventually the fire goes out. The Bible says there will not be a coal to warm at. Christ then creates a new heavens and a new earth. Whether he'll do it in six days or not, I don't know. But you and I will get to watch God speak a new paradise into existence from these balcony seats of the new Jerusalem on the wall we'll see a beautiful new environment for us. The Bible says, blessed are the meek, they will inherit the earth. It's an earth made new. Amen? Amen? You shall go forth from the gates of the new Jerusalem. It says, you shall go forth and tread upon the wicked, for they are ashes under the soles of your feet. If that's clear, please say amen. amen. So they're being, they're receiving their judgment here in this world. New heavens and a new earth. Revelation 21.1, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven. When it says heaven there, that word heaven means atmosphere around the planet. It's not talking about the dwelling place of God. It talks about the birds in heaven, means the air, right? Is the atmosphere polluted now? Yeah, it's going to be clean, pure, invigorating. New heaven and new earth for the first earth had passed away. We, according to his promise, look for a new earth in which dwells righteousness. Friends, the Lord wants to save you from your sins. It doesn't matter what your sins are. It doesn't matter what your addictions or problems are. Jesus is a better Savior than you are a sinner. Amen. He wants to make you righteous. He will make you righteous as soon as you come to him and you accept his son. By faith, we become righteous. He gives us credit for his holiness and he takes our wickedness. And you can have citizenship in this world made new and in the New Jerusalem, you just need to trust him with your life and come as you are. Where will God and the righteous finally live? Tells us in the Bible, behold, the tabernacle. That means the dwelling place of God is with men. Just think about it, friends. God is going to move the capital of the universe to this planet. And we're going to get to dwell with the king. It says he will dwell with them. We will be in the palace of the universe with the king. And all the intelligent creatures from all over God's eternal creation are going to come and say, tell us about how Jesus saved you. Tell us what it was like to know him that way. Tell us what it was like to be delivered, the battles that you went through. And we'll be giving glory to God for his goodness all through the ceaseless ages. We will be ambassadors. That's what it means to live and reign with Christ. We're going to be extolling his virtues to those that appreciate him, not reigning over the wicked. The Bible says, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Friends, don't you want to be in that kingdom and inherit that world? We've just seen how things are going to play out in the last days. And God, this is not very far in the distance, friend. You know, the Bible tells us a day with the Lord is like a thousand years. Here we are now about 6,000 years into human history, based on Bible uh, times. And then we're going to live and reign with Christ for 1,000 years. We are at the sundown right now of the sixth day. That millennial Sabbath is going to begin soon. Jesus is going to come. There's going to be a resurrection. Those that serve him are going to be transformed and caught up to meet him in the air. It says, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Friends, I find comfort in that, don't you? I want to be in that kingdom with God and look into his face. I'd like to invite uh, John and Kelly up. John's going to sing uh, some uh, verses from a familiar song. And then I want to have prayer with you. And I don't know where you are right now in your relationship with the Lord, but the Bible tells us that sometimes we become distracted with the cares of this life. 
And the Lord wants you to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Hope that's your prayer. I shall see the king where the angels sing. I shall see the king someday in a better land on that golden strand and with him shall ever stay in his glory I shall see the king and forever endless praise a saint on Calvary, Jesus died for me. I shall see the King someday. I shall see the King where the angels sing. I shall look upon Him. songs shall be how God ransomed me and has saved me by his grace in his glory I shall see the king and forever endless praises sing t'was on Calvary What could be a greater privilege than to be in that place and dwell with God through eternity, friends? This life is short. The main reason that you're alive right now is to know God in His love and share God in His love. Amen? Love the Lord with all your heart. Learn that lesson. Love your neighbor as yourself. And that's the reason we're having these meetings. Would you like to say, Lord, I want to have that love for you today. Save me from my sins. If there's anything in my heart or my life that's displeasing to you, show that to me. Teach me to be like Jesus. Father in heaven, Lord, we come to you in the name of your Son, and we pray that you'll work in our hearts to help us be real Christians. We know this world is not going to last. We see that, and we want to be ready for your return. We want to be transformed and caught up to meet you in the air. Bless us and help us use our influence to reach others we thank you and pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, friends, the next lesson, we're going to be talking about windows in heaven. Learn how you can be a trillionaire. Come tomorrow night, 7 o'clock.